so let me introduce um, Dr. Juliana Melzi from, um, and I may, did, I'm hoping I said your name correctly, um, from New York University talking about learning from culturally and linguistically diverse families. And then after she speaks to us for about 20 minutes, we will shift over um, and Dr. Ioma Aruka from University of North Carolina will speak. Um, and uh, then we'll have our opportunities for our small breakout groups um, once again. So I will turn it, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Dr. Nelson. And I will make you co-host. So you, sh you should now be able to share. Yes. There you go. Okay. Sharing. Perfect. You, oh, no, I need to do something. I'm, sure I'm gonna share a video, so. I our computer sound, video clip there. Okay, now, can you see my, my screen? Everything okay? Yes. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanna thank the organizers for inviting me to present uh, my perspective um, on um, working with culturally and linguistically diverse families. And I really look forward uh, to our discussions later. Um, the focus of my work is children who come from Latin American backgrounds, and um, I will use the terms Latino and Latine, and I use the, the E as a gender neutral ending, um, as, as Spanish is my first language, and that's what we use in Spanish. And I will use both interchangeably because of communities that I work with identify as Latino and, and not as Latino. Um, I want to introduce, before I begin, I want to introduce to you um, a, uh, a child that, that I met in, in one of our, our research uh, studies. Her name is Ariana. Um, we are seeing, oh, really? Oh, so wait, so then maybe sure. You're seeing my notes. Maybe it's what I'm sharing. Hold on a second. This one? No, this one. How about this? Yes? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, great, thank you. Um, so, um, um, uh, Ariana, uh, she's a four year old child. Her parents are from a recent immigrants from Mexico, um, and um, she speaks Spanish at home. Um, she lives uh, in an immigrant community um, in New York City. Um, and her family shares a one bedroom apartment with her uncle uh, that sleeps um, in, in the living room, okay? When she entered preschool, her teacher um, was concerned about Ariana's literacy and numeracy um, writing skills, as they were not what she expected a four year old should, should, should come with. And so she wondered things like, yeah, are the parents reading to her? Are the parents involved? Are they talking to her enough? And I begin with that case because, because uh, the case of Ariana, because Ariana's case is not unique. All too often, children like Ariana, who come from ethnocultural and linguistically diverse communities, are subject to misconceptions that are grounded on deficit, deficit thinking that is perpetuated by our research efforts, as well intentioned as these might be. A colleague and a friend of mine, uh, Fabienne Doucet, um, writes that as a human endeavor, research is inextricably implicated in the social structures and systems that have served to maintain power hierarchies and accept social inequity as a given. And we heard this loud and clear in our morning, our, in our morning talks. And as researchers, we have, irrespective of what our background is, trained um, in, in a certain narrative and we approach children of color with, with that narrative. And the narrative, the dominant narrative looks like this. And we use this narrative throughout all our work, our work, right? The grants we submit, the articles we publish, the education efforts, um, our work inspires, and we use this narrative to justify our research. 
Um, and it is, so it sounds something like this for the case of Ariana. It would be Latino children currently make up 25% of all children in the United States. By the year 2050, there will be about a third of, of, of the US uh, children under the age of five. About 60% of Latino children live in poverty or near poverty. And a sizable portion of Latino children are underperforming and we have named and called that underperformance the achievement gap. And so a lot of research and effort is geared towards understanding why Latino children are underperforming. And so we ask the question why, and some of the some of the the, um, the explanations that we have given is lack of parental or family involvement. Um, maybe they don't know how to support children's um, a lack of engagement in cognitively and linguistically stimulating activities at home. We have to uh, teach Latino parents how to read to their children uh, or how to talk to their children because they don't know how to do it in ways that are supportive of, of, of the development of children's skills. Um, it's poverty, um, they lack material resources, um, or maybe it's lack of parental education and or lack of English skills. And if you look at this, really what you're seeing is that there's poor lack, 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 right? And so this dominant narrative has been maintained by a kind of research, a research that has used, that has focused on the skills that children do not have and also the activities that parents do not do, using expectations that have been created from our discipline, developmental psychology mostly, and that has been, that has been seen and, 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 and um, thought of as being a culture. And so we use then methodology and measures that might not draw um, out the skill sets that children have but rather they perpetuate this deficit perspective. And the way that I think about it is, is we think of children that are coming from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds as being, as being a, a glass that is half empty. So we're focusing on the empty, the lack of liquid without really thinking about what is, what liquid is in this glass? What, is it water? Um, should we assume it's water or is there something else? Right? And then what we do is then we attempt to fill this glass with, without a solid understanding of what is present, what is present, right? If I put oil there, it will not mix. It will fill the glass, but will it fill the glass in a meaningful way? Um, and, that, and if we knew what the liquid was, we could actually use it as a hook or as a point of leverage to support the skills that children need to um, to develop. And so I think that we can choose, as the first presenter said uh, in the morning talk, um, we can choose a different path, right? And, and, we, and the, a way in which we can do it is to use a strength-based approach. And from my perspective, a strength-based approach really centers families' perspectives and privileges their voices. Um, it broadens our understanding of what we consider to be normative child development with more rich descriptive work that's going to push our thinking beyond the parameters that have been established by our current perspective that has been seen as, as, um, as a culture. And then finally, we value children's cultural toolkit because the experiences that they have at home in their community is preparing them for, for, for something, right? And we respect that, that toolkit that Lee Small talks about as cultural funds of knowledge. And we incorporate that into our educational efforts in authentic ways. And so what I'm going to do now is briefly uh, share with you an example of a project that I'm doing right now that is taking a strength-based approach. And um, the project is, is the meal project, is math and the everyday activities of Latino families. And the aim of the project is to describe um, aspects of, Lat of Latino children's early home math environment. 
And so the work is grounded in uh, culturally, um, culturally informed theoretical perspectives, um, building from developmental theorists such as Rokoff. And I approach this work from the perspective that math, like any other developmental domain, is embedded in our family and communities life. So if we look at the pictures that, that, that we have here, right, the math is present as children are sorting and helping cooking. Math is present as we are dancing uh, because of the rhythm. Math is present in reading. Math is present when we are harvesting. So different children are going to have different experiences and, and therefore they're going to, they're, they're going, their skills are going to be connected to the experiences that they have in, in their everyday. So children's foundational math skills are developing as they participate in these everyday experiences. The majority of, of the work on children's early math environment um, has shown that, that these early experiences are going to be super important for the future math skills and also for participation in, in, in STEM, in STEM um, in, in, in jobs and, and opportunities. And the ways in which families matter for math is in these three particular ways, right? So families are going to connect children to math activities in the community. Um, families are going to engage children in math activities, but also super important is families are going to be exposing children to math vocabulary, right? And, and they're going to encourage children's thinking about math numbers, about um, shapes, about sorting, uh, about finding patterns in the world. And also importantly, um, families are going to expose children to ways of thinking about themselves as math doers. So it's going to support children's development, their math identity development. Um, and so it's super important that we support children's way of thinking of themselves as math doers. Um, most of the existing work on early math um, has relied on survey-based research um, with a priori items, such as playing with shape sorters um, or playing card games um, or, or kind of uh, different um, uh, items that have emerged from, from uh, middle-class European uh, American um, and English-speaking uh, families backgrounds. Um, the majority of the work has also focused on English speaking white families, largely in the United States and Canada. And so as, as, a, as an area of work, home math environment still in, in its early infant state. Um, and so there is, there is compared to literacy, relatively few, few studies. But what this work is showing is that number one, home math, math environment is super important, but generally it's happening little. So then, so then we decide our study, and like I said before, our, our aim, it was really to uncover how Latina parents are thinking about math and how they're using it in their everyday life, right? And, and from a strength-based perspective, what was important is how we designed the study, because we wanted really to, to uncover the math that was happening while also being mindful of the limited funds that we had and the time that we had um, and, so, and so what we did is we wanted to create a study that was ecologically valid and that drew out what we wanted to draw out. And so we relied on ethnographic work uh, about parent-child relations and about home-based activities. So we know, for example, from past work that uh, families from Latin American backgrounds tend to have a hierarchical um, structure in their families. Um, so they tend to they tend to approach in during the preschool years or have a much more assisted situation um, a situation centered approach where the situation where the child has to adapt to the situation rather than the child than the situation adapt for the child which is very, uh, which is a style that is used among a European American families more often. Um, we then, when we developed the, the, um, the methodology and the ways in which we were going to collect the data, 
we pilot tested the data collection methods um, with families, uh, with a range of families, but most importantly with families that were from the same communities as, as, the, as the families that we were interested in, which was low income, um, Latino families, um, immigrant families. And then we sought out input from those families. After they did the, they participated in the pilot, we asked them questions about um, how, how, how likely would you be engaging with your child in this activity? Um, it, what did you think? How comfortable did you feel? Uh, how do you think other, other families would respond to this activity? And once we had those ideas and we finalized our, our methodology, we then, worked in partnership with a, with a local preschool where we gathered all our participants to guide, to finalize our methodological decisions. So from this, this um, experience, what we ended up doing is we did semi-structured um, open-ended interviews to really draw from what, what how families thought about math. We then, um, created three different um, activities. One, what we're gonna see a video in a second, was asking families um, and children to, asking parents to teach children how to set the table for a picnic. And we chose teaching because we wanted the parents to talk a lot. And in developmental psychology, what we tend to use is engage your child in free play. Right, but free play assumes that parents are indeed playing with their children on a regular basis. And we know from ethnographic work that, that Latino parents tend to see play as a child's activity. And so parents are not going to be engaging in a lot of talk and we wanted to draw out that talk. And then we, we added a cleanup task after they finalized this picnic task, this teaching task. And then we, because we wanted to align with the, with, uh, the larger literature, we also did a book reading um, interaction, but the book reading was, um, was worthless, right? Because Latino parents um, have different, um, in, you know, their comfort level in reading, especially in, in English or in Spanish, is going to be varied. So we wanted parents to, to tell a story from a wordless, a wordless. Um, so that's what we ended up doing. And now we have collected data from 75 families. Um, they're all 50% a, a are from Mexican origin and 77% um, and are bilingual. Um, and they range in education level from three years of education to 20 years of education. And that's one mother was three and the other mother was 20. The majority of them is around uh, 11 years of education. And what I'm going to do now is, Ariana was part of a pilot, right? And I'm going to um, show you um, show you a, a, a just a two minute interaction. And what I want you to kind of look at is think about what math is happening uh, in this small interaction. The interaction's in Spanish, but it has subtitles. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Pregúntale cuántos años cumple. Sí. 
Hola, Monkey. ¿Cuántos años vas a cumplir? Creo que dijo tres. Siete. Oh, siete. Estás demasiado grande. Ok. A ver, vamos a... Primero te vamos a partir un pastel, ¿ok? I'm going, to, I'm going to stop because I, I'm being mindful of the time. Um, I'm going to skip um, what the, the graphs that I have, um, which basically show the different attitudes and perceptions about math that families had, their definitions of math, um, and um, the kinds of activities in which they reported um, they engaged in math-related uh, activities. Um, and uh, basically what we're finding and what we're uh, in general, and these are some of the some of the ways in which parents defined uh, math and they talked about math, is that families organically are defining math in various ways, numbers, counting, operations, applied math. I was super surprised to see that they talked about math in, in ways like, you know, math is about solving problems, which is truly fantastic. Families are using math both to understand their lives as well as to in in intentionally teach and entertain their children and hold a variety of beliefs about math itself, right? They do engage in more family-centered activities versus and, and less in child-centered activities. And they're using math in both direct and indirect uh, work, um, ways. But the future research that we're going to do with this is really relate the constellation of concepts, views, and attitudes that we observed um, uh, to then link them to family practices and children's mathematical uh, competencies. And then hopefully use this, these results to inform emerging math efforts targeting uh, Latina families. And so as researchers, um, we have a choice. We've always had a choice about which road to take when we work with children and families that come from culturally and, linguist, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. One road is the road that we are used to and the one that we've been all trained, regardless of our own ethnic, racial, and cultural background. Um, so so I, we need to, as researchers, ask ourselves, through my research, do I want to maintain the power hierarchies and inequities upon which the dominant approaches have been constructed? Or do we break that mod, mode and take the, uh, the road less traveled and approach culturally and linguistically diverse families with humility and with openness to learn from them. Am I, as a researcher, ready to center their experiences and leverage their ways of knowing and learning? And I think that, that I you know, have, um, and, and doing so requires um, that the researcher really explores the preconceived ideas about children and their families that have emerged from years, years of research that have maintained a particular perspective, right? Um, we have, long time ago, there was a deficit perspective and people abandoned it, right? We talked about cultural depri depri deprivation. We abandoned that. But like racism, it was, it was never left. Right? It was there implicit. And as researchers, we really need to be mindful and examine and be vigilant when we are choosing which path. Um, thank you so much. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, my COPI, um, the um, NEO project team members, the funder, Heisen Simons Foundation, of course, um, the East Harlem Bilingual Helps Our Children and Families and Staff. Um, have helped with this problem.